uh, Will Yafi, uh, founder and CEO of Tidwit. Really happy to be here in Ultra. Thank you for the invite, for having us. It's good to have you. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit about what Tidwit does? Yeah, Tidwit is uh, in basically focused on ecosystem enablement. Uh, and uh, we're one of the oldies in our segment, I suppose. So uh, we've had uh, some um, some really interesting experiences that I hope I'll share with, with the community. Uh, but very excited about where it's been, where it's headed. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, learning a little bit from, uh, you know, from Art Peter and from Rick here as well. Awesome. Art Peter? Yeah, so thanks for uh, having me. Um, I'm Art Peter de Mam. Uh, two days a week I work at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam, and three days a week I work as a consultant. And on both places, I uh, yeah, and in, I'm interested in partnerships and ecosystems systems and the impact of digitization on collaboration. Excellent. Rick? Yeah, Rick van der Bos, uh, founder and CEO at Chemex. Uh, Ran the marketing agency for five years prior to Chenex, where we were all around marketing enablement for partners. And I think that's also where I found out uh, how hard that could be, which led to founding Chenex eventually and the uh, partner marketing automation platform. I'm very excited today to talk more about uh, how do you enable uh, the partner ecosystem. Awesome. Well, um, I'm going to kick us off with the first question, which is, I think we're all seeing after the end of COVID, a, a significant recession is landing. That's changing a lot of the economy, how it works. We're looking for a new way to win in the partner game, but with more limited resources. Well, I'm going to come to you first. What do you think 2024 with that tightening of budgets, tightening of people, what's that going to make for the partner and ecosystem landscape? I think what most of our customers are looking for is to do a lot more with less. Yeah. Uh, and I think ecosystems can help them do that. Um, the, you know, all the experimentation, if I may call it that, over the past few years of ecosystems has has proven the case that ecosystems can actually deliver massive ROIs. Within ecosystem enablement, uh, specifically, uh, you know, we're seeing up to 15x ROI. And so organizations can now do a whole lot more with much less saving thousands of hours in manual uh, stuff that they couldn't do uh, and really reaching out and empowering partners to do a whole lot more than they were able to do before as well. So that's really the mantra that most of our customers are looking for, doing a lot more with less through their ecosystem. No, I think I think it's a great point. One of the, the misnomers with a, a recession is that everyone loses. It's not the economy loses, but there are some really huge winners, winners and the people who can work out how to do more with less. They're the ones that exit the recession with the great cash reserves, the great customer base, and they're the ones that really, really see that growth. 100%. Rick, coming to you next, When what do you see 2024 providing some change in terms of what we should see? Yeah, I think around the, maybe to go a little bit further on doing more with less, I think what you really see there, and it is budgets are cut, resources are cut, but what we see on the other side, we still need to recruit more partners make sure we enable more partners, revenue uh, targets are growing. So I think that's really finding the balance there and like, how are we going to do such a thing like where we need to facilitate and enable more and more partners and, and make sure that we go and achieve that growth that we're all longing for. And I think that's where we're really box smart indeed with new technology, new processes, ways of working. We really need to rethink how we are working and enabling our partner ecosystem to make sure that we can uh, we can facilitate it and to your point exit the recession as strong as possible excellent and um, our peter any any uh, other thing you want to add to that yeah i think it's a lot about uh, optimization and being more efficient and, and and a lot of technological solutions are coming in the market that help companies also to uh, increase their bandwidth huh? the number of partners can be increased uh, because of of technology uh, and also learning uh, can start taking place. It's, um, I think it used to be, uh, we have these partners, but what interventions work and which do not work, that has always been a big question. And now we can track much better data. Uh, we can also find out you know, what are the right things to do also in terms of enablement to get into a specific segment or get to a, a, a certain solution to the market. And so I think a lot of the technology is gonna support that growth of the ecosystem. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about that is you, you sort of mentioned uh, efficiencies. I think a lot of people think about partnerships and ecosystems as a very inefficient way of doing business in terms of time and money, but hugely scalable. But I think you're absolutely right. If you can get the technology aspect right, then suddenly you can get the scale 
but with the improved efficiencies and, and 15x ROI, that's what hundred percent and and scale. I love that word. Um, in within ecosystem enablement, uh, we have a slight you know uh, a, a term for it, which is footprint. Imagine if you're able to multiply the footprint that your organization have within you know has within your partner by 10x, 15x, 100x. Um, can you do that? And the answer, and you know, empirically, uh, is yes, you could do that if you're able to connect directly with your partner and kind of deliver it within you know, where they are as opposed to forcing them to do business the way you want them to do. Sure. And so there's a paradigm shift happening here. But the cool thing is over the past, you know, the experimentation that's happened over the past few years has now basically, which was proven in the, within the IT segment, is starting to really uh, you know, kind of dip into some of the other segments. Uh, and other, you know, industries, for example, you know, automotive industry, health insurance industry, government industry, educational industry. And so we're, this is really what we're so excited about. It's not only to limit ecosystems within IT, but also see it expanding uh, as the platform to empower a lot of different partnerships across multiple different industries as well. The, the greatest businesses and the greatest leaders in the world, they understand one thing better than anyone else, and that's leverage, right? Which is how can I get the most return for my action? And that's the great thing about an ecosystem is I can put something in and get the multiplication of multiple mouths, multiple hands, all pushing in the same direction. I think it's really interesting you're touching on the point different ecosystem growth. Oh, Peter, I'd love to come to you. What do you see in other ecosystems? What habits have they picked up from IT that you think are landing really well? Yeah, I think uh, if you look at ecosystems, obviously IT was one of the first to, to do that. But you see that IT uh, thinking and platforms and software, they're now in any business and in any organization. And uh, you meant, already mentioned automotive and health insurance. Um, but also in the not-for-profit, uh, for example. Sure. I came across a great example in the port of Rotterdam, which is the, the biggest port in uh, in Europe. And, well, the port has been around for, what, 500 years or so, so it's not really, it. like you say, this is a new <laughs> business. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, they re really restructured part of the business to better fit with the ecosystem. And so they identified a couple of issues, like how can we improve import? How can we uh, smoothen the export trajectory? There's a lot of documentation that has to go with that. It's really complex and, and there's the tax issues. And, uh, and so now they're co-developing with people in the port, companies that work in the port, they're developing new apps to smooth the entire export process, import process, but also the logistics processes. Uh, so that you yeah, already know that when a ship comes in, you can give a signal to a truck driver and say, okay, at 3 p.m., you know, the uh, container is going to be lifted from the ship and you should be there then. And then the container doesn't have to stand on the quay and take up expensive space and, and those kind of things. So you see that partnerships and ecosystems, they're no longer on the outside of the organization. They also, in fact, affect the uh, internal organization uh, structure. Um, yeah, if you see that in yeah, a, a, a not-for-profit, this is a government business, you can imagine that this is also how, uh, working in, in the for-profit business i'll pick up on this uh if, with your permission but um the i i really like what art peter just ended with uh, with which is ecosystems don't limit themselves to outside and channel and partners in a lot of cases with organizations you see internal ecosystems now being you know this efficiency that was lacking uh you know we we're working with even it companies that have have had massive organic growth but that really operate as multiple companies within one big company they're an ecosystem, but they're not very efficient and they don't see themselves as an ecosystem. So that's, a, that's an example of an internal ecosystem. Then you have the external ecosystems, which is channel and partners, et cetera. And the, the really interesting thing is to find ways to connect both because that's when really kind of growth hits a second gear and third and fourth gear because you're taking all the efficiencies of this organic and you're multiplying it you know, you know, projecting it to your partners and increasing foothold and knowledge across the entire ecosystem barrierless is, is kind of one term that we were talking about before we went on air. Yeah, I think what was really interesting about that is sort of sales philosophy one run one. You want salespeople talking to salespeople, marketing talking to the marketing, ops talking to ops. My my life in distribution has been forever just connecting people who frankly know far more than I do with each other and watching the relationship prosper as a result. Rick, I'd love to come to you in terms of let let's a uh, message to the direct organizations out there. 
they'll tell me a oh, partner's complicated, channel's complicated, ecosystem's complicated. Why in a recession, why when budgets are being cut, would I look to be building a channel? Why, why should I take that risk? Yeah, very good question. Uh, we were just touching upon indeed already making the comparison between direct and uh, and channel or partner when uh, we just uh, recorded a podcast around that. And one of the things we were discussing, and it is when you look at your full customer journey, really looking into, okay, what type of areas do we want to fulfill ourselves and where is the right place for our partners and our partner ecosystem? And I think only looking at your example with Port of Rotterdam, it's super interesting you see this central hub, which is the port, and then all around it, you already mentioned some import specialists, export specialists, truck drivers, so many different types of partners around that ecosystem to evolve into uh, into that. And I, I think that that's where you see, on one hand, there's this complexity thing within uh, uh, partnerships, because yes, it would be very easy to do everything yourself, but it's impossible. Look at the port, you can't do it yourself. If you really want to scale, if you really want to become big you need to look at partnerships and i think especially in a recession yes partnerships is tough not to crack but it's the highest reward with actually the lowest risk eventually because you work with your partners and you reward each other once you're growing together so that's why i think a lot of companies are steering towards partnerships and channel and then we only see that growing at the moment instead of uh, it's the, instead of a lot of the direct organization uh, i think you're absolutely correct one of the things that i'm consistently fascinated by you talk about a big network or a big business i i much prefer the term a deep network because it casts roots into the economy and what we're seeing is you can't have a macro strategy lots of mine micro plays right and that's where the partnership network works so well is i can be a specialist in manufacturing in the northeast of england because i've got my network and i've been working there for 30 years or i've got a 500 year old port it's a it's a very specialized environment it's no good just having a california based us strategy and hoping that that's going to transcend the world you need that local knowledge that local understanding is really deep in the value 100 percent. and uh, one thing where i differ with some of my uh, ecosystem segment uh, uh you know colleagues is you know that there's had been a hesitation in our industry in our segment or industry to go across into some of these uh you know into our ecosystem industry to go across into some of these non-it industries okay. And in reality, from from our experience, we've seen that as a natural progression of things. Um, and you know, before before we went on air, I, I was giving them an example of a very large global hyperscaler that wanted to essentially drive uh, upskilling and enablement uh, in a specific uh, uh, segment, and they wanted to do it with non-traditional partners like universities, uh, um, uh, incubators, uh, accelerators, that kind of stuff. And so they came to do, to do it. And we had no idea how to get into the educational business. We, we didn't have a single sales exec targeting education, but they drove us in that direction. Sure. And so one of the things that, for example, in the events, I and mean, we've been together in, in certain events, and, and, and I know Rick and I have had several uh, uh, you know, conversations, is I'd love to start seeing more and more of our segment starting to you know, uh, work teach, exchange ideas with some of these non-IT industry and, you know, kind of pass on some of this knowledge. I think it's going to come back and benefit all of us because, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it means more consumption for our platforms, right? Uh, but that is what we're looking for now. And again, it goes back to doing mu much more with less because you're, be, you're through the partnerships that we're establishing in these non-traditional industries, what we're able to do is reach segments that we don't really have presence but that they have years and years of experience in, uh, saving us time, investment, and providing us an ROI that's just off the charts. That's how we see the importance of partnerships and in some of these you know, exogenous industries. I, I love that. I, I think that we can add to that, that also helps in remaining distinctive in the market. And because I think there are a lot of, certainly if you look at the bigger system integrators, it's kind of the same solutions. So in the end, it's down to price competition if you offer the same solutions. But if you uh, look across industries, you can come up with completely new value propositions and you may be very distinctive there as well. So I think also competition is going to force organization in that direction if uh, if they're not uh, yeah, already moving into those other industries and think of new value propositions there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, to me, that I think that's critical, right? I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer and we can learn a lot from other industries, even if it's slightly intangible. And, and I think what we see in the ecosystems is there is a lot always to learn from other players. The, the two big drivers for the economy have always been first military improvement right that's where technology is born out of because that gets the first funding especially in the us and the second is then how does that flow into technology and then how does that flow into the rest of the market but i think what we will see is that oh hang on into a non-profit organization oh we're seeing they're using that slightly differently and then what can an aws what can a, a big partner in the typical it channel learn from that um, to pivot the conversation slightly to a the, the big buzzword the, uh, of the moment AI, I think that's where we're seeing huge improvements in efficiencies, especially in the direct go to market, because when you own your whole ecosystem, when it's just an internal ecosystem, you can make those changes much more effectively. Personally, I predict massive change to the channels come from AI. Rick, I'd love to come to you. Your thoughts on AI. Yeah, I think one of the core challenges I always hear around enablement, doesn't matter whether we're talking about technical enablement or marketing enablement or sales enablement, is the creation of content. And I think also back to the example of Port of Rotterdam, if you only hear how many different type of partners there are, a truck driver needs completely different information and knowledge than the import specialist and every time, and then uh, all the ships. Etc. It's such a diverse set of partners, and that's what you see everywhere, especially in an enterprise environment. You've got 10 different acronyms for all the different types of partners, and within those partners, they are focused on different verticals. Some want to add their services on top of it, some don't. And I think that's where you see the better you can segment those partners and personalize their experience, the stronger it is. And I think prior... And I think that's my, the point where I'm heading is generative AI. Prior to the big launch and the big bang of that, it was every discussion like, uh, it all sounds beautiful, Rick, and that I can segment everything till the deepest. I had no resources to create content for that. And I think that's where there's such opportunity that you can take your content that you have and in a very scalable way, scale that towards multiple partner segments and multiple different types of uh, go-to-market strategies. I think that's where there's a massive uh, opportunity. And we, we talked, we started the, the, the show with uh, do more with less. I think AI plus ecosystem, that's doing more and more with even less and less. I'd love to get your thoughts on how that could work. I think it's a massive opportunity. Um, where I might slightly disagree is in where it could be applied. Yes, for content generation. But I think there's also in where AI is applied, even for, for knowledge uh, acquisition. Um, I believe B2C AI is a lot of the companies and organizations are, I was just on a call yesterday evening, one company, massive IT company. So they're going to be selling AI or at least deploying AI, uh, telling us as their provider, uh, we have massive AI restrictions inside of our company. Uh, and, and it was curious because they're an IT company and they know the downside and the upside of AI. The reason for this is because they're looking, as most people across, you know, because AI is so new, they're looking at AI as a B2C function. So you have the brain, but the content is everything everywhere. And then AI applies that brain on everything and in certain cases hallucinates and does all that kind of stuff that you have very, you know, you have very little idea where they're applying it. I think what's going to change with that is the following. You're going to have through ecosystems, a high level of curation of, of content, and AI is gonna follow the content curation. So I do agree in, in terms of curation, or at least content creation as being one of the uh, key uh, elements of AI, but I think content curation is gonna be even more important. Why? For three very quick um, uh, justifications. One, it's gonna be walled gardens of content. So you know where the AI is being applied. Right, You know the brain is there, but that brain is being applied to this specific set of knowledge. If you ask it anything else, it, does, it says, I don't know. Second, because you have this level of control, it's going to be sanitized, it's going to be updated, and it's going to be very, very, very accurate information. And third, which is you know equally important, is you can control it. So be it for GDPR, be it whatever you're feeding it is under your control. And so for all these reasons, I think ecosystems are the perfect, the perfect way to actually provide a smarter, more efficient and scalable AI than the B2C AI.
an, an interesting example that's in, in the news right now, right? We've just seen the writer's strike uh, for Hollywood uh, just get ended yesterday. And the main sticking point was uh, AI usage because you can train AI on particular content, right? Scripts, and then I can just reimagine that script in a different thing, a different setting. Um, and that's been the, 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 the AI has been a huge disruptor and a huge threat to how that ecosystem can work. But I think absolutely, if you can put a, a walled garden, I like that image, and really train it on a very, very specific set of information, then you're going to get very deep knowledge. And it's less threatening. Yes. Less can I you one, add one more? Uh, uh, it's some interest with me. I'm thinking about that walled garden, which I think is a good way to visualize it. But how do you see that in an ecosystem then where you're going to connect multiple uh, uh, companies, for example, in this way with each other? How does... Uh, this specific company can still protect their walled garden or give the right, because you're going to exchange the information and knowledge there. The secret sauce is in the nodal architecture that allows you to bring in multiple walled gardens and create a bigger walled garden created of multiple walled gardens. So essentially you're walling your walled gardens based on what you need, right? <laughs> so that, that's how you do it. And But you, you keep control. Now, that's company that, A... That's that curation piece. Correct. Oh, company A might have components of a walled garden. Uh, company B might have maybe overlap, but some others. And each one are going to have different AI being applied yeah. for their user base. You, you need to think of it as Venn diagrams, right? There's going to be some overlap. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. That's actually how the Board of Rotterdam partly works already. <clears throat> so companies still own all the data, but some of it is shared. Uh, some of it is shared with the Board of Rotterdam, and they can also yeah use in the system uh indicate yeah, who will we share the information with or uh, or not and so that works i think another actually interesting impl application of ai could be on the partnerships themselves if you have so many channels you know and we gather a lot of data about you know where sales is happening what type of enablement are we doing in which industries yeah, you can run ai across the data and find out what works right? and also optimize your partnership uh, with that, and maybe it makes sense to do more uh, education for salespeople in the pharma industry, but uh, financial incentives may work better for the automotive, for example. Yeah. And those kind of patterns, of course, can also emerge from hundred percent. Yeah, I think uh, I think generative AI is really impressive. So it captures a lot of the news, right? When you see a, uh, an image created or whatever, it looks it's very appealing. But I actually, for me, the data-driven AI is going to be the one that changes the game. If you if you go and speak to anyone who works in investment banking, they are interested to know how what information can I plumb in that gives me an edge on the market. There's been a poor crop yield due to weather patterns, right? I'm buying oranges, right? That That's what they're much more interested in a data edge than any content generation. Yeah. Because if I, when we talk about doing more with less, if I know exactly when to point an engineer or exactly where to point a salesperson or a customer success person to the right time, the right place, all of it, because the data is given me an insight, there is a threat here. That's what, that's where you're going to be able to allocate resources most effectively. Um, Rick, any more on how you think AI can be uh, driven into the channel? Yeah, but I think indeed the thing we just spoke about the latest was was really that predictive AI. And I think that's indeed if you can start predicting also in terms of your partners, I think that's what we see more and more. We are managing more partners with fewer resources. We can't talk to every single one of them all the time. A lot of it is managed by our distributors. That's getting wider and wider as well. So I think that's one of the pieces if we can predict future outcomes of that partner, indeed, on one hand, in terms of enablement, but also in general, what type of actions do we see they take? And what is that going to tell us about future growth, for example, in terms of revenue? I think that's where it becomes really interesting because then you can service a lot more partners in a digital way, but then step in with the human touch where the AI tells you to, to do so. Yeah. Here, what I would do is I would I would be careful with one thing because most of the AI that's getting pressed these days, and I don't know if you guys agree with this, is LLM. And those are based on language. So yeah. they're very content yeah. uh, driven. Um, I don't think anybody's yet 100% sure how these models, uh, how good these models are on the data on data. And we started some testing uh, on Tidwit. We've got some reports, et cetera, and you would feed those reports into the model. And we've got a mixed bag of results. 
what I what you know what I'd be careful about as as part of our uh, our, our industry within uh, you know within the ecosystem segment is to over promise based on language models to deliver uh, you know AI within specific predictive analytics. I'd be careful about that. Will it emerge? Probably. Uh, will the LLMs be where it emerges? I'm not sure, uh, but but I know that we can deliver today in a lot of the things that we've been discussing, which is you know regenerative uh, content creation, um, you know porting knowledge and all that kind of stuff. AI can deliver 100% curation, all that kind of stuff. Um, assured, the the analytics. I'd be careful with that. Uh, because it's, I don't know if it's 100% there yet on the predictive analytics side. And we need to be careful to commit to that because you can get all kinds of results. And and do you think, um, because I'm certainly reading very good analysis, but this might be a bit predictive based on a walled garden, right? The narrow you can make your data set, the deeper you can make that data set, then you can make very, very specific uh, predictions that typically uh, tend to work very well. Obviously, where the ecosystem gets well, how good is your data? How much data is it statistically relevant? That's when it starts to become more fragile. And, and like you say, the last thing you want to be doing is making data-informed decisions based on bad data, because that's how we make horrendous mistakes. Yeah, and 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 here the biggest the biggest thing is that we're LLMs specifically, and you can we can see the emergence of a lot of different types of AI, and we will, uh, you know, models that feed into ecosystems. And so the way, for example, that Tidwit applies AIs, we can basically plug in any of those LLMs and non-LLMs into the ecosystem platform that we've got. This is how we, we, we developed it architecturally. This said, uh, right now it's very early in the game for the um, mathematical element of, of AI. That delves much more into the BI space, which has been around for a while. But the AI predictive analytics based on certain you know LLMs, that's that's a big question mark. So uh, it's, it's a mixed bag of results at this point. I don't know if you if you've seen that or if you guys have done testing. We've done testing and we've seen some some mixed bag of results. Yeah, I, I do understand what you mean. I must. I think that's coming to your point indeed. Like if you analyze the wrong data or or like that's what you need to be crystal clear on. Do we have the right data? And I think. And do we have the right model to understand that data? To understand that. Data. Yeah, because you could feed it a lot of different types of data, but if the model is not properly, you know. Uh, I mean, you could have a doctor and you can have an engineer and both of them are brilliant, but you put the engineer to solve a, 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 a medical problem. I wouldn't want a, that sure. doctor to be treating me that's or what, vice versa when you for the doctor to build a bridge for me. I, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want that. Um, and I, I, I think we're going to see, um, and, and I want to see if I can fuse these two messages together. I think we're going to see partner program development massively change over the next uh, years as we deepen channels, as we try and access more markets using using ecosystems more effectively. Can you talk to what you're seeing in terms of par partner program development in terms of enablement? Yeah, um, what we're seeing is particularly, uh, let me focus on IT sure. because that's that might be a little bit, uh, because in, in other industries, it might be slightly different. But within IT, what we're seeing is kind of there were traditionally three types of, well, let me summarize them in three. You've got the reseller type partners and DISTs, uh, as well as the VARs. You have the technological partners, and then you've got the GSIs and the SI partners, right? Th what is happening right now, as the industry has grown, uh, there's a lot of you know, less emphasis on the transactional side and a lot more emphasis on the servicing side, um, particularly on the larger partners. They're focused a lot more uh, on being able to deliver higher quality services. And so that will have direct impacts on enablement because those large guys are prioritizing enablement over everything else. The smaller SaaS players, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier on, are always going to be more focused on the transactional, what we call eco-cell or co-cell. It's interchangeable for us. Eco-cell kind of initiatives. And so we're in a, in a segment where we're sitting right in the middle. We can kind of service the transactional by empowering them with a lot of content, and we can service the larger guys by providing them a whole lot more content. I think there's a shift in terms of that to the larger guys, and those guys are looking for massive enablement initiatives. Uh, and to us, that's that's great because that's what we've been doing uh, all along. 
uh, the smaller players will continue to do the transaction. But I tend to think that the industry is kind of moving in terms of like, you know, there's there's a move towards some of those larger. The tech partnerships are, are, are a totally different beast that we can talk about later if you'd like. Rick, I'd love to come to you, partner program developer. Yeah, maybe to touch upon that a bit more, I think on one hand, indeed, everyone wants to work with the GSIs, and I think that because they are the largest, but there immediately we also state the problem. Everyone wants to work with the GSIs. So I think that's what we see in a lot of conversations we're having with vendors who are creating enablement programs and thinking of how we're going to enter it. It's actually really difficult because there's such competition. And therefore, we actually also see a different trend where more and more people are really looking at how can we serve long tail more? How can we be there at a very early stage? And talent, we always uh, prefer to compare it to football here in the, the Netherlands or in the UK, like scout the talent as early as possible, create a lot of loyalty, create a good relationship there and then grow together in something uh, something big. And I think that's a very interesting way of looking at that and, and therefore also coming back to the doing more with less. The only way you can serve that long tail of partners is with doing more with less. You need scale, you need digital, you need AI indeed to generate a lot of content for them. And I think that's in terms of partner program, we see a lot of focus on that long tail to do that properly also, because uh, sometimes it's difficult to get in in the right uh, way with, uh, with the GSI. Yeah. yeah, and it's about again how do you build a distinctive position? Because if everybody is doing the same thing, that's going to be difficult. And so what I see is that companies are starting to ask questions more about why, <clears throat> why, why, who, and what? Why do we want this enablement? What, what, what is the goal? Is it really doing the same as a competitor, or <clears throat> is it to drive sales in this quarter, or is it a more long-term thing? Next question is then who do we need to enable? Is it just two sales guys at a partner? Or do we want every consultant within one of the big four to be aware of our offering, which requires something completely different? And the rest is what? Yeah, what do we do to enable them? Is it provide information? Is it give sales incentive? Is it training? I mean, the diversity has become huge. Yeah? Uh, so I think we also need to think through much more strategically why we do things and with who we want to do it and then what we need to offer. Yeah, I, I love the way that you, you know, the, the, the who, why, and what, yeah, or the who, what, and why. I, I love that. And and you'll find with different uh, programs uh, a different focus. Yep. Um, and you know my, the latest blog that that I wrote basically is eco cell or eco enable chicken or egg. I called it. That was the blog. Uh, and you you'll find some companies investing, you know, putting more effort into the eco cell for the transactional part, and others, you know, check boxing the eco enable because if they don't do that, then no GSI is going to ever even look at them. I mean. We, we were actually, I met in Denver with one Dutch uh, a, a company, a financial uh, player, sizable, and very interesting. They said, we're interested in going into the GSI segment, uh, but they won't even give us the time of day. What is it that we need? Well, we told them, listen, I mean, what we can advise you is what others are doing. And if you can't enable or co-enable at scale with these GSIs, they're so massive that they won't even give you, uh, you know, uh, at the time of day. They, they need a solution that will touch, as you well said, um, maybe, or, or you also alluded to it a second ago, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of people. If you come in with a solution that's going to engage with a hundred of their potential you know, consultants, forget about it. it. It's just not going to scale enough and it's not a, enough interest to them. The smaller guys prefer the transactional bit. And so you kind of have to see that strategy, which uh, our Peter just, uh, you know, I like that. Yeah, for me, I think one of the huge mistakes that I see people making within the channel is they try and dip their toe in. And it's like, oh, we're going to try it. And it's like, well, that's guaranteed to fail because when everyone else is fully committing and they're building deep and rich partner programs, focusing on sourcing deals, supporting deals, and really driving progressive growth, well, which what? why would a partner be interested in working very closely with you when you're up against, I don't know, Microsoft who have built their entire go-to-market motion on building the best partner program they can possibly build and you're going to dip your toe in and then blame the partner team or that area of the business for, for not winning that land hit. It's, it's crazy. What's that? Yeah. I, yeah. I think if there's one trend that I see is that there is no one generic partner program anymore. I think indeed only looking at the examples we're giving here, global system integrators like Deloitte and Accenture require such a different approach and enablement strategy is what you see with the local SMB companies, the value added resellers, managed service providers. 
And therefore that segmentation of partners is so crucial, really finding out okay, what do these, uh, with the why, how, what, you need to do that for every partner segment. Yeah. And then you can really drive with the right strategy in mind and the right outcome you want to drive your enablement programs towards that partner. And, and you're going to make the partner way more happy because they receive the type of content they want actually. And, and therefore the end user more successful and everyone wins in the ecosystem. Yeah, uh, Peter, I'd love to get your thoughts on on where you think partner programs should be developing. What competitive edge would you be if you're if you're running a global program? What would you be looking to iterate on? Yeah, I I would be interested in in specialization uh, and and delivering different business models for different partners, which ties into what what Peter just said. Um, I think I remember. Yeah, still ten years ago, we only had the bronze, silver, gold, platinum. <laughs> Now that you're already laughing about, about it, they're completely gone, eh? which speaks to your point that you need to step up your game. And also for your partners, uh, you need to come up with an interesting business model uh, and uh, instead of only pushing things out. I think another thing that, uh, that ties into that is, are we really only going to measure sales? Because again, for different business models, you may want to do different things. Perhaps for the first year, it's much more interesting how many people have come to our training session. Could be a more interesting indicator than how many, how much sales did they do they bring in. And certainly in IT, there's a lot of focus on on sales, uh, and I think that's not always a good thing. Some solutions require some development uh, time, and there may be quite different indicators that you have to measure instead of just looking at you know what are the dollars they bring. Yeah, and here the multifaceted element of ecosystems, I think, are usually missed. That was maybe in the early years where some people think ecosystems and ecosystem platform tools are just about eco-cell or others think, oh, it's just about eco-enable or eco, for example, in, in terms of like marketing functions, et cetera. I think it's a mix of all of these and there might be an order, but ultimately you're going to actually have to do, uh, you know, a bunch of all for you, you know, kind of like uh, a mix of all to, to get to the goals that you're trying uh, to achieve. Here, what's really important, what we've seen from customers is is not where they start, but where they where they see themselves ending, and then kind of putting all the puzzle pieces of the puzzle together to get there. If they just bet their eggs on one, and it's they're going to fall short because of you know what Art Peter and 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 uh, and Rick just mentioned, you know they 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 might need co enablement, but really all they knew about was co sell. And so sales weren't coming in. Hey, our ecosystem strategy is not working. Well, that's that's the that's not the right conclusion, right? And so setting the strategy is really important. Uh, lining up the goals is really important. And getting the tools in place holistically is also super important. Yeah. Maybe to add an example to uh, what our Peter said, the need around measuring the right things. Like what's booming in SaaS right now is technology partnerships. And there, everyone has come from partner sourced uh, revenue. So they need to bring referrals. And, mm -hmm. and of course, that's very important. Like that's the number one objective eventually, but it's the outcome we're driving long term. But let's say you're building a program, you're enabling those partners. Actually, what we should be looking at way more is how many integrations do we already have with that partner? What does this do to our product usage with those partners? And then what does that do to net revenue retention, upsells? And then if you see positive results there, you have a very strong business case to drive that into the rest of the company of your partner. Like, hey, look at this. We drive more net revenue retention, more upsell, more product users. CSMs will be happy. Account executives will be happy. And like everything else becomes easier if you have a lot more grip on those leading metrics. I think one of the things that um, I often see within a partner program is this fallacy that you build it and it's done, right? You've got to build it and then great, we're locked in for the next 10 years. And I, I actually want to take a, a question from the audience because I think it ties into this very, uh, very clearly because obviously you don't build a partner program and it's done. But uh, how do you ensure channel marketing strategies remain adaptable in the face of market in changing market conditions? Rick, given that you're our marketing guru, what do you think we should be learning from how we still maintain agility within an ecosystem? Because I think that's one of the real challenges that we face is when you run a direct organization, we want to change our marketing strategy. It's very fast. So how can we ensure that when market conditions change, we're able to drive that messaging and those changes through our ecosystem? 
Yeah, it's a very valid question. Uh, looking at the end of the question specifically, when is it proactive versus uh, panic? Versus <laughs> panic. That's a really good good question, and then indeed because it's all about sentiment, right? And how your partners eventually uh, uh, adopt it, and then also the end user, of course. I think looking at that is always really important to look at what's happening in the world, both in the positive side with trends like AI, where you can maybe jump on, but also indeed around the recession. Like I can speak from personal experience at Genex, for example, we were also figuring it out at a certain moment, but then we found out, yeah, everyone needs to do more with less. So you need to wrap that message into everything you do and show how can I provide value to, do, to you if you do more with less. And I think the same as if you're in a channel marketing role, let's say of an IT vendor, uh, whether it's hardware or cybersecurity or whatsoever, look at what type of trends, what's happening in the world and how can we tie that into channel marketing uh, program, but always in our Peter's work with the end goal in mind. Stay very close to your own core values and what your end goal is, which your company, which your program, and there you tie in the trends to get that traction because it just works in marketing to, to jump on the trends, but stay true and close to yourself and, and the end goal in mind there. Otherwise, it can feel like panic if it's like pivoting really hard all the time. Yeah, one of the things that I think really, uh, really I see sometimes, and, and you're right to an extent with uh, marketing, right? You've got to jump on, on, on some of these trends, but you can really tell when it's the core of what someone's speaking about and when it's a fluffy thing that we're just going to talk. Every business I now see is an AI business, and you can really separate the ones who go, this is ingrained in what you do versus, oh, we've, we've done something a bit flashy. And in my mind, that's a very risky behavior, right? Because the last thing uh, in, in an ecosystem, the one thing we need is integrity. Because once once that integrity is broken, the, the ecosystem dies, right? And so, well, I'd love to get your thoughts on how do we maintain agility? How do we drive that into the ecosystem and continue to maintain that integrity at the same time? Well, I'm going to try and hit three birds with a stone oh, because the prior action, the prior question is on blockchain and ecosystem. And I think uh, I have an answer to this and it, it answers, it also touches on the integrity issue. Uh, I've seen blockchain uh, being utilized within things like badging tools and things like that, you know, just from an architectural perspective. The problem with blockchain is, for the most part, is you have to put your data out on the blockchain. And that is a big no-no for a lot of organizations. And so the platforms that we're seeing that are deploying ecosystems, uh, excuse me, the organizations that are deploying ecosystem platforms, uh, they're not asking us for blockchain. A blockchain is not a requirement. In fact, I, in my opinion, it would be a turnoff for them if we said your data is going to be out on the blockchain. Uh, this also applies for AI. Some of the cases that came out in the news is, for example, was it um, Samsung or one of those large Korean uh, uh, Keiritsus? Uh, they were so excited about AI, they put a bunch of their data on AI to run reports, etc. And then that those reports became you know accessible, and so they panicked. Um, and so. I, I think from that perspective, uh, ecosystems uh, are, I think, the middle of, of the way. You're not going full-blown B2C, opening it up, you know, be it AI or blockchain or any of that. And you're not keeping it closed uh, to such a degree where you're really kind of uh, almost, you know, clogging any type of innovation. Uh, and that answers the second point, which is about, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, marketing. I think the, the question of keeping marketing uh, strategies, marketing strategies are gonna shift. The question is how do you keep everyone aligned? And you could do it without the ecosystem, without having an ecosystem, or you could do it having an ecosystem. Uh, you know, in, in, in my mind, having an ecosystem, for example, in marketing tools, such as what Chanex offers, is amazing because what you're able to do is you're able to essentially if you have to shift your strategy wisely, so as opposed to in a panic mode, then you could shift it and everybody else is up to speed that same instant. That is a very different approach from shifting a strategy and having to wait two years for it to, to, to deploy. So I think timing from that perspective uh, also is, is, is a key, a key point and keeps the integrity within your channel because your message is controlled to a certain degree, but at the same time opened up to your channel for them to push it out. The, I think to the adding up question, I mean, we assume that's all pushing out. We have to change our partners. But you could also say, no, our partners are also a source of information. And they give us an indication about where the market is heading. And that keeps us agile. And 100%. If you simply think about your ecosystem as, oh, we have to push something to them, and they have to know they can also be a source 
of change and information so that also when you have to push out a different message, it works because they already know where the market is headed. So we shouldn't see the ecosystem as a as a one directional. Yeah. And, and an example of this, I agree 100%. An example of this is a large telco in the US. I don't know if I, if you know that case, but uh, for us, so that very, it's, it's a massive telco in the US. They deployed an ecosystem on Tidwit enablement uh, with some of their largest, 20 of their largest global partners. And what they did is they said, we want it to be bi-directional. And so we said, well, yeah, you could, you could exchange knowledge. And they said, well, it's not just about exchanging knowledge. We want the solutions that have been built by the partners on our technology to be searched by our internal people as well. So it became a bi-directional flow of knowledge from them to their partners and back, you know, for a showcase of those partners into their own ecosystem as well. hundred uh, percent. Partners are closest to, to the market eventually and, yes. and therefore the best source of information, no matter what type of program you want to build around enablement, marketing, technical, etc. They know best what's playing with the end user and therefore co-creation of your program and enablement is a really strong thing to do. And, and to me, it's just an example of, and, and we often joke here at Chanex, is that you know the channel can work the same way it did in the 90s, right? It's like we pick up a phone, we call a partner, hopefully they do some business and we call them next quarter and hopefully they've got a deal for us. And it's just technology letting us down because if we could have the bi-directional communication work really well, if we can have the data flow work really well, then we wouldn't work the same way. We wouldn't make a decision on high and push, it would be a far more collaborative and I think a much more accurate experience because as, as Rick says, I if I'm based in uh, the Netherlands, I have no idea what the Brazilian economy is doing, right? No real indication on how market forces are different over there. I tell you who does, my partners who live and breathe it, right? And, and we need to get that communication working uh, backwards and forwards. Uh, another question uh, from Teresa. So what would a good first step or next step be for companies to integrate co-enablement, sale and marketing into their strategy? How can a smaller company benefit from these ecosystems? Well, you've obviously spoken a lot about uh, co-enable, co-sell. Is that only for the top performing businesses, the biggest businesses in the world, or can smaller ben businesses benefit from it as well? No, smaller businesses can benefit as well. I mean, we've got some SMBs deploying it. Uh, I think the smaller businesses have the, uh, the advantage of not having legacy systems that they have to kind of rip and replace or, or integrate into, so they have less baggage to carry. Uh, so size in that sense doesn't really uh, matter that much. Um, now, I think to, to Teresa's questions, which co-enable, co-sell, or core marketing, uh, I'd go back to what uh, you know Art Peters uh, was was highlighting with respect to the strategy, and and and, and Rick pointed to it. Uh, if they have enough resources to deploy multiple workloads, if we call each one of them a workload, then perfect, because one feeds into the other. For example, if you can get visibility into which one of your partners are the most co-enabled, you know that that's going to be the partner that's going to likely be the best to co-sell and so you apply more mdf in their direction as an example right believe it or not organizations global chip makers i won't mention their names us based will still to this day distribute mdf without realizing in, in you know ex ante so in, in advance they you know dish out all of this mdf marketing funding without really knowing or having a guide for which one of their partners are going to perform better what is the best leading indicator for that, for example, is, you know, again, you would deploy, for example, co-marketing uh, or co-enablement, and then you would tag along with co-sell. Now, if you have to make a choice, that's when you start looking at, at the order of things. But ideally, it's a mix of these three together. And I regard co-enablement and, and, and co-marketing as, you know, kind of like siblings. Yes. Co-sell is a little bit more focused on just sales execs and alliance. Whereas co-marketing and 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 and, and co-enablement is really org wide for us, um, so so it's it's a matter of order, it's a matter of resources, but ultimately a mix of of all of these will be what drives the um, the partner program ecosystem strategy towards success. Yeah, for 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 me, balance across those three are, are what makes and, and we touched on Microsoft earlier. You know, and anyone who's listening to partnerships, I'm able to start laughing because I'm a, such a huge fan for how they go to market. And what you see there is they know well, it's not just a marketing strategy, it's not a sales strategy, and it's not an enablement strategy. You've got to pull those pieces together because 
it would be like, oh, well, we only have AEs, but we don't have BDLs. We only have BDLs, but we don't have AEs. No, the ecosystem works because we need everyone to understand how to sell it, how to market it, and actually know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Rick, in terms of uh, your perspective, how can we drive for smaller businesses in particular? I'd love to double click on the marketing element. How can smaller ecosystems or smaller businesses really leverage marketing to drive into the channel? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think... Before I dive into that, what I was thinking about just now is, it's again, really with our Peter's framework, why, who, what, like you start with your why, like what, which is usually very end user focused as well. Like what kind of value do we want to bring to the end users? And then what type of end users? If it's very SMB focused, you're probably going to work a lot more with value added resellers, the, the more smaller part, but if it's very enterprise focused, we'll be leaning towards global system integrators, et cetera. And if I would be a small company that doesn't have a lot of resources and I need to choose, I would first be extremely clear on what end user customer do we want to service. Based on that, what type of partner fits, fits that most well? And then what kind of enablement does this partner need the most? And I think there, Will just taught me actually that in GSIs, they don't want to start selling before they are trained. So there it's very simple. You need to start with enablement and upskilling before you can even get into the co-selling motion. And then bringing that back to the SMB motion, there you work with value-added resellers, with managed service providers. The biggest difficulties they all have is generating demand. They have great technical people, they have quite, they have quite a sales army, but then usually less than one FTE or marketing that needs to drive opportunities with multiple vendors. And that's very difficult for them. So if I indeed towards SMB partners, there, it should be a lot of focus on co-marketing. How can I help them to generate opportunities so we can start the co-selling motion as such? And, and I agree with Will in terms of the siblings. Co-selling is the result of the good co-enablement and co-marketing. So find out what type of partner are we going to serve and then pick your battles if you had to choose one. But indeed, I agree that the combination is, uh, is best. Sometimes they also need to change their mindset because they say, yeah, but then we have to talk to these partners. It costs a lot of time and we don't have time. I think, yeah, okay, but that's the time in the beginning. But after that, you can use the time of your partner <laughs> and, and you will save a lot of time in doing your, your marketing. Uh, uh, but that's what I hear a lot with the, the smaller businesses. Yeah, we don't have time. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I would add to this is that when, we, when we're starting to move into the industry space now, we're seeing less emphasis on co-sell because some of these indus industries are not in the sales uh, you know, function, government. Uh, for example, um, uh, uh, education, right? You mentioned nonprofit, et cetera. Uh, so when we talk about, you know, one of the questions is, well, where does co-enablement uh, start and where does it end? And, you know, to me, co-enablement is, is essentially uh, is all the functions before marketing or together with marketing right before the sale. So if sales is not, what these organizations within industry are looking for, healthcare, for example. Healthcare might be hospitals looking to interact with one another, et cetera, share data while protecting it for GDPR or HIPAA or whatever kind of stuff. They're looking to create ecosystems that share knowledge, but they're not really selling to each other. So it's not a sales function. So one thing I would also uh, kind of highlight here is as we start moving our solutions beyond IT into new arenas like industry, et cetera, there might be a slight shift of emphasis from just ecosystem, ecocell or ecocell uh, into, uh, into uh, you know, some of the other kind of um, workloads like, uh, you know, whether it be upskilling, whether it be workflows, whether it be workspace, ecosystem workspaces, a whole bunch of workloads that sit and you know, squarely within the eco enablement and the eco marketing space. Yeah, I really like what you're saying around uh, eco enablement and eco marketing being siblings. Because if you really think about it, when we when, when we market even in the IT space to end users, we are giving the end user the information that triggers a buying pattern. Right? You are enabling the end user with information. So it's really the messaging vehicle. But whether we're doing that into an internal ecosystem or an external ecosystem, we're trying to take the right message to the right user. And I think if we if we are constantly obsessed in ecosystems with how do we maximize value? And I think this is where sometimes people get it very wrong and they go, how can we monetize them, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's how can we provide value to the partner who then provides value to an end user? That's when suddenly we build partnerships that really stand the test of time and, and work very well. Oh, oh Peter, I know you, you uh, 
think a lot about ecosystems, not necessarily in the IT space. Do you see that big shift away from co-sell, especially I suppose in, in, in non-profit and far more focused on marketing and enablement? Yeah, I, I, I think you see it across all kinds of, of industries. Uh, I've, I've just done some research based on LinkedIn data and to look at where do we see this most? And obviously uh, IT and, and tech, uh, but automotive, for example, mm. uh, banking are really big. Where we see it still less is more in construction and chemicals, really more old fashioned heavy industries. Although surprisingly, even there, I find organizations who do this and, and who invest in also an ecosystem and a digital ecosystem, because surprisingly also in chemicals, there's a lot to do. So I think we've only scratched the surface. If we only look at IT, going back to the discussion we had earlier, uh, you see it uh, across, across the board. Sorry, gents, I'm going to put you uh, right on the spot because we have two minutes left. Um, I'd like to get 30 seconds from each of you around why we should be optimistic about ecosystems over the next 12 months. Well, it's a massive opportunity. I mean, not only IT, but all of the industries. And we're very happy with where we are in, in, in eco enablement. I'm extremely optimistic and uh, and bullish for the future, uh, although there might be, you know, like with recession and stuff like that, some, you know, but, but that's just short term, long term, extremely bullish for our segment, for our different solutions, uh, and for the readiness of the market to start assuming them. Uh, well, I think all companies start to turn into ecosystem companies, and even those that don't want to. I've also worked with companies that go direct and say, yeah, but let's see, what are your partners? And then it turns out they have much more partners than they actually realize. They're just not making any use of them. Uh, so it's also getting that yeah, that mind shift at board level. And I think that's that's really happening uh, across uh, a lot of different industries. Well, I'm certainly a career man, so it'd be a mistake if I didn't give my boss the final word. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I think there's nothing better to, to skill in eventually as a, as a business than partnership and uh, uh, the channel. And I think what I like so much about the ecosystem is that you're multiplying network effects. And that's the thing what's happening. I always think in vertical partnerships, which is the channel and horizontal partnerships between companies and alliances. And you get like all these cross relationships. And it, just when I visualize it in my mind, that's where it's like, this is going to be an amazing opportunity for everyone in our sector. Amazing. Well, first off, I'd love to thank you uh, all for your insights. I appreciate we've missed uh, a few questions, but we will follow uh, back on all of those uh, after the session. Thank you very much for tuning in and listening, and we'll see you next time.